Good morning. Welcome to today's View on Africa. My name is Zachary Donenfeld, and today we'll be talking about Central Africa, specifically the CMAC region. Um, the CMAC region is made up of these six countries shown here, um, and there are uh, a number of similar social, political, and economic characteristics of these countries um, that make them uh, particularly ripe for study. Um, in, they're all uh, commodity dependent economies and we're all really negatively impacted by the downturn that started in 2014. Um, they uh, jointly approached the International Monetary Fund for a bailout under the uh, extended credit facility and are still in the processes of that negotiation. Um, it's kind of unclear uh, how it will ultimately pan out, but that's something to keep an eye on for sure. Uh, there are also some political characteristics uh, that make this region um, particularly interesting uh, for students of political science and international relations, and that is one of those uh, commonalities is the what we're calling regime durability or entrenched regimes, sclerotic regimes. Um, the paper, which has just come out today and is available on the website and will be uh, available in the chat function at the end of this talk, um, goes through this uh, regime durability in a little bit more depth. But this slide is a good uh, gives you a good kind of sense of the problem of entrenched regimes in in these Central African countries. Um, just a, a quick uh, couple caveats. Dennis Ngueso from uh, Cameroon was president from 1979 to 1992. He returned to power um, after a civil war in 1997. Um, so those were non-consecutive years. Another note is that the Bongo family in Gabon um, has actually been in power for 51 years. Uh, the, the most recent handover um, came as a hereditary succession. Um, another thing to note about these countries is these, uh, these political parties don't just control the executive, um, they also build quorum-proof majorities to um, position their control across legislative institutions as well. So for example, in Cameroon, the Cameroon People's Democratic Movement controls 148 of 180 seats. In Gabon, the ruling party controls 113 of 120 seats. In Equatorial Guinea, it's 99 out of 100, um, and so on and so forth. So these uh, regimes have solidified their power across executive, legislative, and even judicial institutions in these countries, which really reflects in their um, uh, across their scores on governance, um, across these dimensions that we're looking at here. So uh, the the you know first column is regime type, which is measured by the Center for Systemic Peace, and that measures regime type on a scale of uh, negative ten being a hereditary monarchy to positive ten being a full-fledged participatory democracy. Um, civil and political freedom is more uh, self-explanatory, um, so, so on and so forth with government effectiveness, corruption, uh, and the Mo Ibrahim Index. What we can see clearly here is that uh, CMAC as a group performs well below the other um, regional economic communities in Africa. It performs well below the score for Africa as a whole and uh, also performs well below the average score for the world. Um, so, you know, uh, this table shows pretty clearly that um, the CMAC region is suffering from poor governance across a number of different metrics. Now, uh, that is likely to be um, that, that is likely driving um, what we see in this figure, which is the increase in reported incidents of political violence in these different countries from 1997 uh, all the way through 2016. Um, and from, from 2012, we see uh, a really, uh, really noticeable increase in almost every country. Um, and now, I should note that Central African Republic is excluded from this figure because of just the inordinate amount of political violence that that country experiences. It kind of it dwarfs everything else on this graph. So um, in the report, there's a, a, another figure that, that shows that phenomenon more clearly. Um, but the important takeaway here is that all of these countries are experiencing um, a uh, rise in reported incidents of political violence um, that n none of these countries have experienced uh, at any other point during this data set. Um, part of the, the cause of that is 
undoubtedly poor service delivery and frustration with the um, the entrenched regimes and the lack of political evolution in a lot of these countries. Um, so what this table is showing is the uh, number of people in millions without access to various uh, public services um, and other economic opportunities. Um, and what we see is an increase almost across the board in all of these different measures of service delivery and economic opportunity. Uh, I think some of the most important things to highlight here are that the working age population in CMAQ countries will grow by about 25 million people between now and 2040. That means that governments in these countries need to find about 25 million additional jobs. That's if they hope to increase uh, keep the current rate of unemployment where it is, which um, it's difficult to find a reliable estimate, but you know is probably in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent um, and higher in younger populations. And this could drive uh, an increasingly fragile demographic situation towards the brink um, as uh, the challenges with the growing population um, in the context of poor service delivery are exacerbated by these uh, political, social, and economic tensions that stretch uh, throughout countries and across boundaries in this region. Um, you also see an increase in the number of adults without private primary education, an increase in the number of stunted individuals, and a very large increase in the percentage or the uh, number of people without access to improved sanitation facilities. Um, that number increases by about 16 million. Um, so uh, a good way to, to think about this is that, you know, there are challenges in this region for sure, um, but there's also progress being made. I think this figure um, points to that duality um, and, and kind of helps bring it out a bit. So what you're looking at here is the uh, number of people, again, in millions uh, living in extreme poverty. Those are the bars, the blue bars. The orange line is the percentage of population living in poverty. And what you see is a, a fairly steady decline in the percentage of the population living in poverty. But because the population is forecast to grow by over 40 million people in the next 23 years, the, the, mil, the absolute number of people living in poverty continues to rise despite a decline in the percentage. Um, so there is progress being made in a lot of these countries. It's just not happening fast enough, and it's just not happening um, inclusively enough. Uh, so it, it's not uh, being spread to a wide enough um, segment of the population. So in light of these challenges, the report that we put together outlines um, a number of potential interventions. Um, in, in light of these challenges, we think uh, that countries in the region first and foremost need to redress the issue of state capture and pseudo-democratic governance. Um, states in this region really need to move toward genuine participatory democracy uh, and manage the transitions through um, what we call the anocratic space very carefully. Um, so if you remember when I was talking about regime type, um, there's a, uh, a large body of literature in political science that suggests that um, Hereditary like anocracies are pretty stable and democracies are pretty stable, but there's a uh, middle ground that is incredibly um, precarious for developing states. Um, so countries in CMAQ uh, are generally in this anocratic space, um, and as they move towards being genuine democracies, it will be incumbent on both uh, regimes that are in power as well as opposition regimes um, to negotiate in good faith and to uh, move forward with an eye on service delivery and inclusive economic growth. Um, we think a, a key component to developing that inclusive economic growth will be to promote regional economic complementarity 
Um, the free movement of goods and persons is fundamental to promoting international trade, both within CMAQ and the rest of the continent. Um, during the 2017 CMAQ summit, the heads of state committed to accelerating regional integration, um, but its effective implementation will have to be considered over the long term because there just hasn't been enough time elapsed since the agreement was implemented to, to determine if it's going to be effective or not. Um, this will be a good step um, towards diversifying economic growth in the region. Uh, a key condition of the IMF negotiations is that countries in the region diversify away from a dependence on the primary sector. So that means becoming more productive in agriculture, as well as shifting away from the high energy dependence in the region. Uh, the average dependence on the primary sector in CMAQ countries is about 35-36%. Um, that's significantly higher than the global average, and reducing dependence on that sector, sector will um, help uh, the, the region and countries in the region um, better absorb exogenous price shocks um, as a result of commodity downturns globally. Uh, finally, um, Countries in the region need to build regional infrastructure and tie that investment to social goods. Um, a regional infrastructure platform will reduce time, uh, time to transport goods as well as cost. Um, and it's important that that core infrastructure is also tied to what we call social infrastructure. So this is health, education, um, water, and sanitation. So uh, these... Uh, Dual investments in, in infrastructure and human capital can really help accelerate inclusive growth in the region. And finally, uh, the that investment in human capital has to be inclusive as well, right? So we need to fully capitalize on women and youth in the region and invest in skill development in those communities um, just as aggressively as, as in the capitals and uh, cities and for males.